Hello, everyone. I'll give everyone one moment to connect. We're having a couple technical difficulties, so I apologize that we're starting a little late. Um, but we can go ahead and get started. So um, my name is Madison Calhoun. I'm the Senior Manager of Educational Programs here at the Environmental Law Institute. Welcome to ELI's webinar, Farming for Our Future, the Science, Law, and Policy of Climate Neutral Agriculture. ELI Press and authors Peter Lehner and Nathan Rosenberg recently published a book of the same title. Although it is now sold out on ELI's website, it is going to a second printing and will be available on March 9th on our website. The authors have joined us along with other expert panelists to speak about essential opportunities for policymakers to realize climate neutrality in agriculture. We at ELI are so grateful for your engagement and participation today. We also wanna thank our expert panelists for their time and energy preparing such a great program for everyone. Today's program will consist, by, consist of presentations by each panelist as well as a Q&A session afterwards. We encourage all of our attendees to submit questions. Please do not wait until the end of the presentations to do so though. You can go ahead and submit your questions as soon as you think of it using GoTo's question box. And with that, I will introduce our moderator today. Based in New York, Peter Lehner directs Earth Justice's Sustainable Food and Farming Program, developing strategies to promote a more environmentally sound agricultural system and to reduce health, environmental, and climate harms from production of our food. Peter holds an AB in philosophy and mathematics from Harvard College and is an honors graduate of Columbia University Law School. Peter, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Madison. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with my truly wonderful panelists. Um, and this is a really exciting time to think about agricultural policy uh, because now many, many people are beginning to see that we really need to think about our agricultural system and reform it. Uh, it does a great job producing a lot of inexpensive commodity food, but the COVID-19 epidemic, for example, showed that it was vulnerable in many ways uh, to bottlenecks and breakdowns. The more frequent storms and droughts and wildfires we're having show the vulnerability of our agricultural system to the climate change that it is helping uh, to accelerate. And in addition, we're seeing a crisis of obesity and diabetes and many other diet-related diseases uh, that are making us rethink the food that we're producing. So all of this is coming together uh, to focus our attention on the climate, on the agriculture system, which has really gone under the radar screen for a long time. Folks uh, in the field, they pay attention to it, but most others really don't. And so what our book is about and what the seminar is about is to try to shed some light on the agricultural system and the opportunities to reform it. How did we get here? Uh, my colleague, Nate Rosenberg, and I wrote this book, which is the basis of this uh, webinar. And that came about because uh, two professors, Mike Gerard and John Dernbach, uh, were writing a book on how to decarbonize the entire US economy, and they asked us to write the agriculture chapter. And as we researched this, we found there was really not much out there. Uh, on the science, law, and policy of how to decarbonize agriculture. Uh, there is some work being done in the field by thousands of uh, farmers and ranchers. There are some scholarly articles, but there really wasn't much understanding among policymakers about what we can do in this field. So we did what lawyers sometimes do, and we wrote a book on it as a way of teaching ourselves what we can do. So we're now going to have this wonderful panel to talk about some of the aspects of this book. I'm going to lay out a little bit of the, the regulatory background. And then Marcia DeLong, who is a senior scientist at the, in the Food and Environment Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists and a wonderful colleague, uh, will be addressing the science of, uh, of climate change, from, uh, of agriculture climate change impact, which is really very different from the sort of what we may have in our minds, burning fossil fuels. Then Third Hefner, who has been long time the founding policy director uh, for, for 30 years at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition uh, and is now a consultant to many organizations on sustainable agriculture, probably one of the most knowledgeable people on the farm bill uh, on Capitol Hill or anywhere else. We'll talk about some major opportunities uh, 
there in current and future programs under the Horn Bill. Then we'll have Lingxi Chen Yang, who is a the environmental law fellow at the Indiana University's Environmental Resilience Institute and a visiting scholar at Maurer Institute of Law. And starting in the fall, will be a professor at University of Utah School of Law. And she will be talking about agroforestry uh, and the really extraordinary opportunity that trees, uh, agroforestry, offer to help our system become, our food system become more climate neutral. And then Nate Rosenberg, uh, who is now a visiting scholar at the Food and Law and Policy Clinic at Harvard Law School, and an adjunct professor at Iowa College of Law, will talk about trade and tax and grazing policies. I will also say that Nate is uh, really the best conceivable co-author one could imagine. It has been um, nothing short of an honor to work with him over these many years researching and writing this book together. So that will be what the panel will, will focus on. So I'm going to set the stage a little bit, which by saying that agriculture is really very different from many other sectors of the economy. In most areas of the economy, the environmental impacts are largely governed or limited or addressed by the environmental statutes uh, that many of you uh, are aware of. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the hazardous uh, substance statutes, and many others. And yet that's not the case with agriculture. Most environmental statutes either exempt or have been read to exempt uh, much of agriculture or haven't been applied to agriculture. The EPA has not addressed uh, air pollution, for example, from most agricultural vehicles. Uh, they're decade, over a decade behind, and even developing precise models for measuring air pollution from confined animal feeding operations. Courts have limited the reach of the Clean Water Act uh, to these confined animal feeding operations, even though they're explicitly mentioned in the Clean Water Act, and there are other exemptions in it. And since many agricultural activities don't require permits, typical approaches such as using NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, which is an important avenue to ensure environmental impacts are considered uh, in other areas, doesn't really apply uh, in most instances to agricultural activities. But there are some options, uh, and we talk about them in the book. Uh, the EPA actually can use some of its powers to address some of the worst pollution sources of agriculture. And since, as we'll talk about, agriculture is very highly concentrated. It's the eucolic family farm that you may think about. It really, it's not how most of our food is produced. It's produced by a much smaller number of very large industrial scale facilities. And as EPA does in other areas, uh, with thresholds for regulation, EPA could address air and water pollution through its existing authorities, should it choose to. And that should it choose to is why we're here because chances are uh, it will not soon choose to do so. That's a politically tough issue uh, because of the long-standing political power of the industrial farm lobby and the very legitimate reason that agriculture is a major and a very important part of the economy of every state in the country. Uh, and so we have to look for other ways to address agriculture's impact. Uh, and that is where we will now uh, first uh, to understand that, why agriculture is different, turn to Marcia, and then we'll see policy opportunities that Fern, Ling Chi, and Nate will talk about that will give us the opportunity to address agriculture's impact on climate and we hope help reform our system so it produces healthier food in ways that are better for our workers, our environment, the animals, and our climate. So over to you, Marcia. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Let's see, is this working? How do I move? I thought I knew how to move forward here with the slides, but I'm struggling. Does anyone know how to? Um, yes, oh, I can move there forward. Go. There you go, but you're moving them too. Perfect. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining today. And many thanks to the organizers and congratulations to the authors of this 
excellent new book, which is truly an outstanding new resource to communicate around many of the issues surrounding agriculture and climate change. So Peter mentioned that my goal here today is to provide an overview of the science of agriculture and climate change. Um, I'll be covering many of the concepts that are in chapter three of the book, in case you happen to get a copy. And these will include things like um, presenting some of the unique challenges and opportunities associated with agriculture as compared to other industries uh, when it comes to climate change, uh, presenting some background on technical aspects of greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural food systems, and um, providing just a few thoughts on what this all means for the potential to leverage agriculture as part of a solution for climate change. No, okay, perfect. Okay, so the first thing to, to mention and to be aware of here, and Peter mentioned it as well, is that agriculture and food systems as a whole are just extremely vulnerable to climate change and in a number of ways. So first, climate change is affecting precipitation and temperature patterns. This is fundamentally changing what crops and animals can grow where and how much, and is creating new agricultural pest and weed challenges, which creates additional burdens. Second, secondly, climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of many extreme events, things like hurricanes, floods, droughts, wildfires, and extreme heat. All of these threaten crops, livestock, and the lives and livelihoods of farm workers. And furthermore, these climate change impacts do have widespread ripple effects. So just for one example, increased floods on farms, which are made worse by dominant farming practices that we have today. These can cause flooding in downstream communities and can also exacerbate losses of fertilizers from farms. This is a cost for farmers. And it also leads to the creation of dead zones in lakes and lakes and oceans that can be completely devastating for ecosystems and communities that rely on them. A third thing that is happening is that climate change is affecting the food supply. This is not only by affecting yields of key crops, um, but it's also affecting prices and food quality. To give you just one example, the elevated carbon dioxide levels that are driving climate change have also been found to affect both protein and micronutrient levels in many key crops. And the impacts of these types of changes are likely to be mostly felt by those who are already food insecure. So the problem, the, um, the potential risks here are very large. So given the ways that agriculture is, is vulnerable to climate change, it's clear that there's a very strong incentive for agriculture to be part of the solution and to do so in ways that can also help agriculture adapt. Another thing to be aware of when it comes to agriculture and climate change is that agriculture has a very large physical footprint. It covers a huge land area, both within the US and globally. This map here is showing you the land area around the world that's used for cropland in blue, grazing in red, and forestry in green, and it's a, it's a lot. In the United States alone, agriculture accounts for 52% of the total land mass and is the largest type of land use. Um, so this vast extent of agricultural lands is really important for a few key reasons. Uh, first, this again drives home the importance of recognizing agricultural vulner vulnerability to climate change and therefore the very urgent need to build a more resilient system overall. And secondly, since agriculture does cover just as much area, even small improvements to its climate impact, for example, on a per acre basis or on a per farm basis, can really have a significant impact, something to keep in mind as we move along. So of course, in addition to being highly vulnerable and having a big land footprint, agriculture and food systems contribute substantially to greenhouse gas emissions at many scales. And reducing these emissions has been found to be essential to achieving climate goals, such as the Paris Agreement. So this is really important. Um, getting exact estimates for agriculture's contributions to total greenhouse gas emissions is very challenging for a number of reasons, some of which we'll touch on today. Um, but estimates are consistently high, and I wanna walk you through just a few of those. So the left figure here is showing you an estimate for global emissions where direct agricultural contributions are shown by that little red slice of the pie with the barn symbol. And there are just over 10% of global emissions. But there are also just as many emissions, that, uh, just about as many emissions linked to land use change through largely through deforestation, which is also linked to agriculture, bringing that value closer to about a quarter of total emissions. Further, 
Um, a number of estimates have tried to get at including the broader upstream and downstream emissions that are linked to agriculture, which would give you a more accurate picture of food systems and where there are opportunities for agriculture to help address the problem. And in these estimates generally range from around a quarter to a third or maybe even a little more of global heat trapping emissions um, being contributed through agriculture and food systems. Now in the United States, the most widely cited estimate for agriculture's contributions to climate change is from the EPA. Um, this estimates that the agriculture sector directly contributes about 10% of the nation's heat trapping emissions, and that's shown in the, in the figure on the right. But I think understanding the scope of these emissions and the opportunity for improvement requires a much closer look. So with that in mind, here is the most recent data from the EPA. Uh, it's from 2019, and it shows the major sources of, of U.S. agricultural emissions that are accounted for within the EPA's estimate. There are several really important takeaways from this figure. So the first is just that most of these emissions are from three sources, and all of those three sources are tightly linked to animal agriculture, so something to keep in mind. The largest is agricultural soil management, and in this figure here, you can see it's actually cut off, so it's quite a bit higher even than the scale of these other ones. Um, that this is agricultural soil management and it's mainly about the associated nitrous oxide emissions. Now, uh, nitrous oxide or N2O is a potent greenhouse gas. It's released naturally from soils, um, but it is released in greater amounts in response to agricultural practices, particularly fertilizer use and the excessive amount that we use today. Um, and keep in mind that this, is, this is includes both um, soil emissions from croplands, representing about 73% of these emissions, which, by the way, we use a lot of our cropland for animal feed uh, across the nation, and also the, the remaining amount coming from grazed grasslands. The next largest category is enteric fermentation. Uh, this is actually the result of a digestive process of ruminant animals in the U.S., mainly cows and sheep. And in this process, it's belching and exhaling that releases methane from the animals themselves Methane is another very highly potent greenhouse gas, much more so than carbon dioxide. The third major category is manure management. Um, this leads to both methane and nitrous oxide emissions. And it, this is very well described in the book, so I recommend you take a look for a deeper dive. But um, due to the highly concentrated nature of animal agriculture, as Peter mentioned in the beginning, um, most of these emissions are actually coming from a relatively small number of the largest operators. So, really key to, to think about when you interpret this data. There are other emission sources are much smaller. These are things like methane from rice production and the carbon dioxide from urea fertilization and lining. Okay, so beyond the major sources, there are two other key takeaways from this figure. One is that, as I've mentioned, the, the emissions here are mostly nitrous oxide and methane. These emissions are very difficult to measure in many cases, and there are, there are a lot of challenges and several assumptions that are involved with um, creating the, estimating the so-called global warming potential. This is used to allow a comparison of these gases, the impact of these gases relative to carbon dioxide. So just be aware that together these two issues mean that there is significant uncertainty associated with the emissions um, that are shown here for agriculture. And secondly, there's a number of sources that are not accounted for within the agricultural sector by the EPA. Most notably, things like carbon stored or lost from land use for agriculture, either historically or presently. On-farm energy use is not included in the sector by the EPA. Land use change and other broader food systems emissions, such as energy to produce fertilizer. So this is an incomplete picture um, of the total impact of agriculture in the U.S. Now, this lack of a full picture of agriculture's emissions is problematic, uh, in part because it just leaves us with an incomplete picture of the opportunity for improvement, which I think from our perspective is really, really important. The other downside uh, of looking at these emission sources in isolation and without a big picture perspective is that it misses the chance to see just how tightly connected these greenhouse gas dynamics are um, to management practices and to each other. So therefore, changing practices can affect the dynamics of multiple gases and many aspects of ecosystems and food systems, which people oftentimes don't realize when they're, when they're looking at these figures. So just for example, current dominant farming practices that both disturb soils and 
um, through heavy tillage and rely significantly on fertilizers and other chemicals. These lead to nitrous oxide emissions and soil carbon losses. They also create soils that just don't hold water very well. This contributes to vulnerability to droughts and floods and so on. So there's a number of things happening when you think about uh, the management practices that we have today. But in contrast, healthier soils and plants actually absorb carbon through photosynthesis as they access the water, nitrogen, and other nutrients that they need to produce the sugars and starches that grow our crops uh, above ground and roots below ground. So but when we think about this by changing management practices, it is possible not only to reduce several of these greenhouse gas emissions, but also increase the carbon stored in soil uh, and build resilience to climate change impacts. In even better news, uh, there are a number of farming practices that can achieve these benefits, and these are generally the kinds of practices that follow four key principles. So keeping soils covered, maintaining living roots, minimizing disturbance, and adding diversity. And while we could spend a lot of time talking about just this, um, just a little snapshot to show that to be a little bit more specific, um, science has shown that practices like no-till and cover cropping, rotating crops, improved grazing management, planting perennials, including agroforestry, which you'll hear about later, have been shown to have significant carbon sequestration potential and can lead to net greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and this is especially the case when you think about back to that map showing the vast amounts of land available um, for these practices. Now, here in the United States, the reality is that these types of practices are barely utilized. Um, just to give you a little quick glimpse into this data from the USDA does show that, for example, cover cropping and agroforestry are practiced on just a tiny fraction of the nation's farm operations, the upside being that there is lots of room for improvement. Oops, I gotta go, can you go back one for me? Oops. It caused a problem. But anyway, I will start to, to share that just to be, oh, thank you. To begin the wrap up here, uh, all in all, the science points to a tremendous opportunity to address numerous challenges through agriculture. Not only do we see an opportunity to, to, to transform agriculture in ways that contribute meaningfully to climate change mitigation and adaptation, but to do so in a way that can help address a number of other longstanding challenges within food systems and to advance more sustainable and healthy and equitable food systems. Um, but we do need to realize that success will depend on understanding and navigating some of the key challenges and uncertainties. Um, so in closing, I wanted to leave you uh, with just a few of those uh, to highlight. So first, both greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sinks are highly dependent on both management and a number of other factors, and thus they are highly spatially variable from the field to farm to larger scales. This means that policies and programs need to be locally and regionally tailored. Second, the opportunity to sequester carbon is extremely exciting, and the rates of carbon sequestration do decrease over time as ecosystems reach new equili equilibria, the nature of the bi biological nature of carbon sequestration, and they're subject to reversal if management practices change. So again, something that needs to be carefully considered when we're thinking about policies and programs. Third, measuring, verifying, and accounting for changes in greenhouse gases and carbon storage continues to be challenging um, for a number of different reasons. And so we just simply need more science to continue to improve this. And fourth, while there's an, a huge opportunity to attain co-benefits through changes to agriculture, as I briefly mentioned, such as cleaner air and water and enhanced biodiversity and so on, uh, valuing these services is also challenging. And so we need to continue to do work there and, and um, figure out how we can best leverage those opportunities as well. So all this said, the opportunity is absolutely enormous. The science is strong. Uh, we are keep continuing to work on it and figuring out how to ways, ways to leverage this big opportunity should be a top priority. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Marcia. That was fantastic. Uh, and uh, you gave a really wonderful presentation. And you set us up well because uh, we often talk in our book about the challenge being how do we accelerate adoption of practices. We don't have to invent new things, but we have to dramatically accelerate the adoption of these practices. And by far the best opportunity we have to do that is in the farm bill. And Fern, over to you, who, as I said, knows more about the farm bill than pretty much anybody. 
Well, uh, thanks, Peter, and it's great to be with everybody today. I'm glad you all joined the webinar, and uh, I just want to uh, also put in my good word for uh, the great work that uh, that Peter and Nate did on this book. And uh, I'm going to be focusing in uh, for those of you who have read it or are going to read it on the what's uh, chapter five, where it gets into farm policy, um, and. Uh, I really think that um, you you can't get a better text uh, to look at what the opportunities are to change farm policy than than what they have in this book. So I highly recommend it. Let me just do a few farm bill basics. Um, farm bills can be a, a, a good organizer's dream because they happen regularly and more or less on time. So roughly every five years. So they're predictable. That's a, that that can help on the organizing front. They're also, you know, omnibus legislation, meaning that they they include many many underlying laws that get revised in the farm bill, um, and they cover a broad swath of what uh, the Department of Agriculture does. Um, I, it's important to note at the outset it doesn't cover everything. I think. Um, it's important for people to realize that uh, the Farm Bill doesn't deal with environmental regulations. It doesn't deal, it, it doesn't really deal with food safety issues um, writ large, which are mostly over at FDA. It doesn't obviously deal with tax policy because that's in the tax uh, committees, though tax policy is huge in agriculture in terms of incentives and disincentives doesn't deal with labor, so no food chain worker, farm worker kinds of issues aren't dealt with here. It doesn't deal with public lands, just private lands. It doesn't even deal with the school lunch program, which is in a separate piece of legislation. Um, that being said, it deals with a lot. Um, and, um, you know, in broad strokes over, uh, since the beginning of the Farm Bill and the New Deal, but especially over the last 50 years, there's been two major prongs. The nutrition prong, which is primarily the food stamp or SNAP program, but other nutrition programs as well. And then the farm side of the bill. So just in rough numbers, each five-year farm bill spends roughly a half a trillion dollars of public resources. And about three quarters of that, give or take, is in the nutrition title. That's the, that's the classic log rolling proposition that is a farm bill. Uh, you know, food assistance is important across the entire country, including in urban and suburban areas. Um, and, you know, three quarters of the funding in a farm bill is for that. So that provides a lot of the votes for a farm bill because the number of farming counties in the country that are really highly dependent on agriculture continues to shrink. So it's a, uh, it's a very distinct minority within the congressional representation. Um, so, uh, looking at the farm side of the farm bill, there's there there are many many titles of the farm bill, but there are three big ones in terms of the farm side of the farm bill: commodity programs, uh, crop insurance, and conservation programs. Um, those are the big three today. It hasn't always been that way. At the beginning, it was just the commodity programs. Uh, uh, conservation entered in a big way in the 1980s, and crop insurance in a big way just 20 years ago. Um, but now crop insurance is the biggest in terms of financial resources with conservation and commodities tied for second place. Um, there are, like I said, there are a lot of other titles. There's uh, forestry dealing with private forest land. There's renewable energy programs, uh, both, both on farm and in rural communities. There's agriculture research and extension. There's farm credit and finance. There's trade. Uh, and many others. Uh, in the last several farm bill cycles, the last four farm bill cycles, really, there have been major new provisions for beginning farmers and ranchers, for socially disadvantaged or BIPOC farmers, for organic agriculture, for fruit and vegetable provisions, uh, local and regional food systems, and so on and so forth. So those are the kind of newer topics to the Farm Bill, um, uh, still a small portion of the Farm Bill funding, but uh, major in terms of where people are uh, are gaining increased political interest in the bill. So uh, the last big bill was 2018. Um, it, it started and was finished in the same year, which used to be routine. Farm bills 
historically, you know, started and were completed and signed into law in a one-year period of time. That routine has been badly broken. Um, in fact, the last time before the 2018 Farm Bill that it started and finished in the same year was all the way back in 1990. Um, and there's been multiple bills in between that took longer. The low point was probably reached in the what should have been the 2012 Farm Bill and then should have been the 2013 Farm Bill and finally was became the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, uh, but the norm is still a year to a year and a half, so hopefully the 2023 Farm Bill that's coming up will will happen in 2023, though with a increasingly polarized politics, nothing certainly is for sure about that. Um, you know, so let me just pause from Farm Bill just for a moment to say, you know, Farm Bills establish the contours and and establish the legal foundation and the funding streams for any administration to move forward with farm policy. But each administration can and does, you know, uh, use those underlying uh, legal foundations and funding streams to you know, push forward their own priorities and undertake administrative reform. So I, I won't belabor that point. I'll just give you two, you know, primary examples right now. One is from the 2018 Farm Bill, all of the conservation program regulations were finalized just in the very final days of the Trump administration. And um, uh, so they could, uh, at least theoretically, uh, be reopened and go through a new rulemaking process. There are many reasons why that would be a really good idea because there's some uh, some problematic provisions to say the least. But as of right now, there's no sign that that's happening. Uh, it, it's not like some of the environmental areas where rulemaking is being revisited. Um, there seems to be very little interest in this new administration in revisiting those rules, which I, I find unfortunate. But even short of revisiting the rules, there's lots of other implementation decisions that, that can be revisited in terms of more discrete policies, uh, payment rates, ranking systems, and so on. And all of those could be tweaked substantially so that they address climate mitigation and resilience uh, a lot more than they do today. Um, another example is climate hubs. Uh, USDA has regional climate hubs that that help with uh, research and extension and uh, data collection around climate change in agriculture. Those were begun during the Obama administration, but have never been authorized by Congress. So they were funded by Congress through the appropriations process at fairly low levels. That is an area where the Biden administration is taking action. They've proposed uh, major increases in, in climate hub funding, and that's pending in the appropriations bill that hopefully will, will be finalized in a couple of weeks. Um, so, okay, back to the Farm Bill. So let's dig into the 2023 upcoming Farm Bill. Um, again, Chapter 5 in the, in the book um, does a great job of laying out the issues. I can't even begin to cover half of it, but I will just sort of hit some highlights. So the, the book correctly points out that agriculture is very short, as Peter said before, on regulations um, and very long on assistance through credit and finance and crop insurance and price and income support and research and conservation and all of those things make up the the real guts of any farm bill so just looking at conservation um, since it plays such a big role in terms of uh, potential responses of agriculture to climate mitigation there's both technical assistance and financial assistance. A lot of the farm bill, you know, there's some attention paid to the technical assistance part of that, but financial assistance is where the rubber really hits the road in terms of farm bill discussions. There are three main categories of conservation programs. There are working lands programs, meaning how to incentivize farmers to farm in ways that are in concert with the environment. Um, there are land retirement programs, uh, one major one to take land out of production and put it in conserving uses. And then there are easement programs um, that are what they sound like, conservation easements um, on farmland for a variety of reasons. So uh, before the 1985 Farm Bill, there was basically no Farm Bill funding for conservation. There were conservation titles, but uh, they didn't come with money attached. That began to change in 1985 and fast 
forward to today, uh, we're, we're, we're approaching $6 billion a year in conservation spending through the Farm Bill. Just to put that in perspective, I, I don't know off the top of my head EPA's total budget right now, but it's in the it's roughly 10 billion ish dollars. So the conservation of the Farm Bill is more than half of uh, EPA annual budget uh, on an annual basis. So it's a big deal. Um, uh, the um, soil health and weather variability were the two <laughs> most commonly used euphemisms in the 2018 Farm Bill. You know, the, the last Farm Bill that used the word climate change, you have to go back to 1990. None of the bills since then have even used the word. Um, and that was true of the 2018 Farm Bill, but they did have a healthy dose of soil health and weather variability um, that, that seemed to pass muster with the agriculture committees. Will climate be a focus more forthrightly in the 2023 bill? I certainly hope so. It's certainly an open question. Um, you know, one indication that it might or that it will is that Build Back Better, uh, though it hasn't become law did include major provisions and major new funding for the Farm Bill Conservation Program to the tune of about $23 billion. Um, so a major chunk of Build Back Better and, uh, and one of the chunks, frankly, that is still alive, though it's on life support at this point. But it, it, I think that if something does happen, I think those provisions are likely to be uh, kept in place. There is one kind of quasi-regulatory provision in the Farm Bill that is sort of the link between conservation and the commodity and crop insurance programs, and that's called conservation compliance. It also entered the Farm Bill in 1985. It is kind of a quid pro quo. If you want Farm Bill subsidies of various kinds, you have to agree to control soil erosion and to uh, not drain uh, wetlands that are on farmland. Um, that made a, that was a major big advance in farm policy. It had a real impact. It still has a real impact on the wetland side. It, sadly does not have much of an impact uh, anymore on the soil erosion side, but it's still the law of the land. Um, you know, a big question for the future is, will that quid pro quo for billions and billions of dollars in, in farm subsidies each year uh, be expanded to cover soil health, climate, uh, water quality, and so on and so forth? Uh, it certainly seems like um, that is long overdue, but not really part of the active discussion going into the 2023 Farm Bill. I hope that changes. So let me touch on sort of the bread and butter of the Farm Bill, the commodity programs and crop insurance. I don't have time to, to give this any kind of detail, but just thumbnail sketch. That's uh, crop insurance uh, is, a, is roughly $10 billion a year in taxpayer subsidies and commodity programs, roughly half of that or about $5 billion that they vary depending on what's happening in the farm economy. So they can they can skyrocket up, they can reduce somewhat, but you know, as a general rule, you're talking about roughly $15 billion combined in, in farm subsidies. And just in case that's confusing on the crop insurance side, um, and because we don't necessarily think of insurance as being subsidized all the time, but the taxpayer pays roughly two thirds of the premium for um, farm crop insurance uh, policies each year. So it's highly subsidized, more, more subsidized than any other kind of insurance for sure. Um, you know, so on, on net, on balance, uh, while commodity programs and crop insurance do uh, address important concerns within agriculture, they also push towards greater specialization and farm expansion and consolidation, or to put it another way, they move in opposite direction from agricultural diversity and economic opportunity. And that has an enormous consequence for climate, for water quality, for the health of rural communities, for the possibility of gaining entry into farming uh, from new uh, and beginning farmers. So, uh, you know, the, the book really, I think, does a good job of addressing this critical need for a change in the direction of government support uh, to move towards support for carbon farming and environmental protection and really, you know, begin to address 21st century issues in agriculture rather than continuing to address the issues that were 
uh, ripe 100 years ago when farm bills got started. So, um, you know, I, I, I can't put enough of an exclamation point on that. It's really, really important. Um, you know, it certainly is not going to happen in one farm bill. You know, I'm not making that prediction. Uh, farm bills are evolutionary in nature and one change builds on another change. But um, it, it will be a telling moment, I think, whether we begin to take steps towards that needed transformation or, God help us, move in the opposite direction or just merely retain the status quo. I think those are the those are the three doors that I think Congress has before them. Hopefully, they'll choose the door that leads in the direction of major transformation. I'll just add that I was really pleased that the chapter on farm policy in the book starts with agricultural research. Um, that often isn't the case. People jump right into commodity support or jump right into conservation. I was really glad to see that because, in my view, the the research, the public research investment that happens today, you know, really to a, in a major way determines what kind of agriculture and what kind of food system we have a generation from now. And um, and in my view the research title doesn't get the full attention that it deserves, but it is a major title of the Farm Bill. We do spend about $3 billion a year uh, as uh, at, at the federal level on, on uh, agricultural research and extension. Um, I will I will note that that public investment in agricultural research is declining in real dollars and has been for a long time. We're falling behind privately funded research, which has major implications for what kind of research gets done. And we're falling behind, you know, we used to be the, the global leader in agricultural research. That's no longer the case. There are several countries that are uh, ahead in terms of research investment. And in terms of the rest of the federal government, you know, if you compare it to, to NIH or NSF or DOE, agriculture, doesn't nearly get the resources that it should. And one way to get out of that <laughs> situation is to have agricultural research focus more and more on the major issues of the day, including climate mitigation. If if that if it was clear <laughs> to members of Congress and the public that you know investing in agricultural research was investing in a major solution to climate change, perhaps the funding picture would get uh, brighter. So that's that's what I, I hope will happen. It was a piece of Build Back Better. It, it, it kept getting, every time Build Back Better got smaller, the ag research part of it got smaller. In the end, it was down to $2 billion, uh, which wasn't a lot, but at least it was something. Um, but maybe that also is an indication that this next farm bill will pick up where Build Back Better left off and, and really make a real go of it. So there are lots of other titles of the Farm Bill I could address, but I won't. But if you have questions, I'm happy to answer it. Let me just end with saying that there, there are several pieces of legislation that I really need to mention. And the first and foremost is the Agricultural Resilience Act. This has uh, been introduced in both the House and the Senate, the House bill by Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine, uh, herself an organic farmer, and in the Senate by Senator Heinrich from New Mexico. It establishes a national goal of net zero agriculture within 20 years. It realigns major swaths of farm bill type programs. It adds funding. It uh, improves conservation compliance. It addresses livestock and grazing issues, which unfortunately often get left out of the farm bill. Um, and uh, also addresses areas like on-farm renewable energy incentives and solutions to food waste issues and so on and so forth. It's a really important bill. It's comprehensive. It um, really is an, another great blueprint for what needs to happen in the next farm bill. Another major bill like that is the Climate Stewardship Act introduced by Cory Booker in the Senate and Abigail Stamberger, Spanberger in the House. Um, it, so it had some similarities to the Ag Resilience Act um, and some differences, but the, the, the good news is there are members of Congress who are giving really serious thought to comprehensive approaches to dealing with climate and agriculture and, uh, you know, providing grist for the mill for the next uh, farm bill. So time will tell whether we look back on the 2023 farm bill as a major turning point 
the outcomes of the November elections will certainly loom large in that regard, but uh, my hope is that we do uh, have a major advance and put, put climate and agriculture on the Farm Bill uh, page this time in a way that hasn't happened in a long time. So I'll stop there and we can move on. Great, thank you for that. That was terrific. Uh, and a big part of our purpose in writing the book, uh, and I think you know, my purpose in hosting this webinar is to make people understand or give people the opportunity to understand how important the farm bill is. So often, uh, frankly, much of the environmental community does not pay attention to it, even though you know, it has a tremendous environmental impact to our land, our water, our air, our climate, our biodiversity. And so hopefully we'll get better results if more people pay more attention to it. And I was struck by something you said that the Farm Bill of 1990 included the word climate change. I brought one of the very earliest climate change cases in 1988. And interestingly, nobody disputed the reality of climate change. And then there became this big move to deny the reality of climate change. And uh, even in the 2007 Massachusetts versus EPA case, uh, the federal government is saying, oh, we don't know enough about climate change to be able to do anything. Uh, fortunately, now we are coming back to the recognition that climate change is real and presents quite a threat uh, and also a driver of opportunity. And one of the big opportunities is perennial agriculture and trees because of their biomass and, and many other reasons. And so to focus on that and the opportunities there, an area that gotten very little attention so far uh, in terms of those and sheep. Thanks for that nice introduction, uh, Peter. I'm, I'm so excited to be here with all of you today and uh, ecstatic about uh, Nate and Peter's book. Um, so I'll be talking about agroforestry today, both uh, the importance of agroforestry and policy barriers and some thoughts on policy reforms to, to encourage the adoption of agroforestry in the US. Um, a, a lot of the, the following material is based on an article that Nate and I uh, along with Andrew Curry and Hannah Darren at the Yale Forestry School, uh, wrote in an article for the Ecology Law Quarterly. Um, I also want to echo Peter in saying that Nate is just such a wonderful co-author, uh, one of the best that one can hope for, and uh, I really enjoyed writing this with him. Um, so to start off with, uh, what is agroforestry? Um, the technical definition is that it's the incorporation of woody plants into cropland or, or pasture land. Um, more colloquially, it's farming with trees. Um, so there are many ways in which farmers can, can farm with trees, and I'll talk about five of them. Um, maybe the, the most famous one uh, is uh, windbreaks, which are planted on the perimeter of farms. Um, in 1933, in the wake of the Dust Bowl, uh, President FDR sent an army of young men as part of the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, to plant windbreaks. Um, kind of across the, the U.S., and they planted trees on nearly a quarter of, of uh, all the continental U.S. Um, in addition to reducing soil erosion from rainfall and extreme temperatures, windbreaks also provide wildlife habitat. Um, and as a result of uh, reducing soil erosion, uh, wheat and soybean fields in, in Kansas and Nebraska um, with windbreaks have been found to be 10 to 16 percent more productive than, than those without. Um, next slide. So uh, the, the second type of agroforestry practice is silvopasture. And uh, this, this incorporates trees on pasture land or, or grazing land. Um, here pictured is the, the Dehesa in central Spain. It covers an area about the size of Rhode Island and Connecticut together. Um, it's a traditional pastoral management system where cork and oak trees are grown alongside pigs and other types of livestock. Um, the pigs feed on the acorns from the oak trees and uh, are sold at a premium. Um, a lot of the farming income actually comes from cork, from the cork trees. Um, the system is super productive and it's been around for, for some 2,000 years. Um, alley cropping, so next slide, uh, involves cultivating crops or livestock in between rows of trees. Um, so picture here is an aerial photograph of a 100 acre farm in southern Wisconsin called the New Forest Farm. This is one of the country's most ambitious large scale conversions of a former degraded corn farm. Um, the trees on the farm are a mix 
Um, sometimes there are hazelnuts, uh, chestnuts, walnuts, apples, and between the trees, um, the, the alleyways are planted with asparagus some years, um, and some alleys are, are grazed by pigs and cows. So this is a very diversified system, and uh, much like civil pasture, farmers of um, alley crop systems can enjoy a very diversified income stream. Um, and this is especially important with the arrival of more extreme weather due to climate change. Uh, here in Indiana, where I currently live, uh, 2012 was the worst drought in history. Uh, that was followed seven years later in 2019 by the worst um, flood on record, uh, which caused planting to be delayed. Um, and so diversified income streams for farmers are really important with, with, um, with the arrival of more extreme weather. Um, the next type of agroforestry practice uh, is riparian buffers. Um, these are quite wi widely known. They're planted on the perimeter of uh, waterways. Uh, pictured here is a riparian buffer lining a farm creek in Story County, Iowa. Um, so they, as I said, they're widely known to be effective in reducing um, runoff of soil and fertilizers. Um, they've been found to, to stop over 97% of soil sediments from washing away um, and in parts of the Midwest. Uh, and as a result, they prevent significant water pollution downstream. And the last type of agroforestry that we looked at uh, is, is forest farming. Um, this is the cultivation of shade tolerant mushrooms, herbs, and berries under an existing uh, forest canopy. So that's the next slide. Um, maybe the most well-known type of forest farm is the maple syrup farm. Um, they're mostly found in, in Vermont and in the Northeast, but this is actually a picture of a maple syrup demonstration forest in, in Missouri as part of the University of Missouri's College of Agriculture. Um, the market for non-temper forest products in the U.S. is valued at an estimated $1 billion. Um, dollars. And, and given that forests are a huge carbon sink, expanding the economic potential of forests beyond timber, um, which right now I think constitutes 1% of global GDP, um, will really help preserve forest ecosystems that are, that are vital for climate change mitigation. Um, so I, I've talked a little bit about the climate adaptation and economic benefits of agroforestry, but really the main uh, reason that we wrote this paper is that agroforestry as a whole has enormous potential to draw down carbon um, especially when compared to annual cropping practices um, like corn and soy, um, which dominates uh, large parts of U.S. agriculture, even when they incorporate conservation practices like no-till and cover crops. Um, so according to a 2012 study, uh, incorporating trees in, in, in the ways that I just talked about on just 10% of all U.S. ag land could offset more than a third of fossil fuel emissions domestically. Um, so that's uh, more than all of our transportation emissions, all the cars and, and trucks on, on the road. And um, uh, Peter uh, kind of pointed to a simple reason, right? Trees, particularly in a diverse ecosystem, capture more carbon than annual crops, which um, have to be planted and harvested each year. Um, and even when the tree dies after decades, uh, the wood decays in the soil and decomposes into a stable form of carbon called humus which can remain in the soil for up to 5,000 years if, if left alone. Um, we broke this estimate down to the different practices of agroforestry, and we found that um, silvopasture and alley cropping capture approximately 97% of the benefits from agroforestry. Uh, silvopasture, given that pasture land is more than a third of the US uh, land area, and alley cropping, you know, given the density of, of trees on an alley cropped farm. Um, No-till and cover crops, which are really important soil health practices and um, sort of more widely known than agroforestry, uh, only sequesters about two-thirds of the greenhouse gases that agroforestry can sequester on the same amount of land. And so agroforestry is really kind of a transformative um, climate smart agricultural practice. Um, we also looked at some of the policy barriers to the adoption of, of agroforestry. Um, as Fur talked about, federal policy has played a major role in shape, uh, shaping farm production and farmland since the 1930s. Um, government payments rose from about 3% of net farm income in 1929 to 40% um, in 2020. 
uh, in addition to direct commodity payments, uh, federal farm policy also funds uh, research, extension, infrastructure programs, um, as well as conservation practices. Uh, and a lot of these programs were developed decades before the benefits of perennial and diversified agriculture became widely known. And as a result, there are just many more federal dollars available for um, annual monocultures, uh, particularly corn and soy, um, than there are for perennial diversified crops like agroforestry. Um, we found that these policies really shape what our farms look like, which in turn shape social norms around the idea of farming with trees. Uh, many of the farmers and practitioners that we, we talked to as part of this research um, talked about how farmers are hesitant to plant trees, uh, in large part because trees simply break with tradition. Um, one agribusiness professor that we talked to, uh, next slide, um, talked about how you know, his father's generation and grandfather's generation spent you know, years and years of toil and sweat moving trees off the pasture, and it just doesn't click when, when you tell them to plant trees on the pasture because it doesn't meet their idea what good farming is. Um, so there's a real kind of social norms barrier to farming with trees um, that is, you know, we argue is an effective federal farm policy. On the other hand, uh, federal programs can really help spur enormous transformations in agriculture. Um, as I mentioned, dust storms in the Great Plains in the 1920s and 30s um, caused in large part by farmers planting just thousands of acres of monoculture wheat pushed the creation of a federal program um, that planted trees on, uh, on a quarter of American land in just seven years. Uh, unfortunately, because the federal program only lasted for seven years, many of those trees have subsequently been uh, pulled up and replaced with corn and soy. And so one study found that in, uh, in Nebraska, I think in, in 2017, um, only half of those original trees from the 1930s are still standing. Um, and so, you know, policy reforms and sustained policy reform is really necessary to, um, to both spur the adoption of this practice and to sustain it over generations. Um, so as part of our research, we identified several kind of near-term as well as long-term policy reforms um, that can help sustain farming with trees. Uh, currently, the primary pot of funding available for agroforestry exists at the federal level um, as part of the conservation programs that, uh, that, that Ferd mentioned. Um, a lot of these conservation programs typically pay farmers to implement conservation practices on a per acre basis. Uh, and the problem is that rules for many of these programs just simply exclude uh, diversified perennial agriculture um, like farming with trees. So, to give one example, um, the Conservation Reserve Program, the CRP, I think is the second biggest conservation program um, under the USDA. And it pays farmers to plant trees and perennial grasses on uh, environmentally sensitive farmland, uh, which they take out of production for um, 10 to 15 years. Uh, the problem is that farmers are prohibited from grazing animals around the trees that they're planted to plant. Um, and they're also required to plant trees really close together. These are called density requirements. And so we found that um, these rules, along with others, uh, other conservation program rules, reiterate this kind of conventional divide between productive farming and conservation, right? So annual crops and livestock are productive, whereas anything with trees are not. Um, the, the result is that many farmers at the end of um, these conservation um, contracts pull out the trees and replace them with corn and soy um, because they see conservation programs as a temporary source of income before they replace it with um, the initially productive um, land use. And so, you know, making this program, making CRP more friendly to, to alley cropping and silver pasture would just really call for changing the wording of some of these um, funding conditions. Um, so that was kind of one cluster of reforms that we identified. Um, the problem is that you know these near-term fixes could push you know ecologically minded farmers to switch. Um, truly sustaining the practice of farming the trees requires more transformative policy reforms, and um, this this starts with with research and land access. So you know unlike many parts of the world like Spain and Portugal, 
there's a huge information deficit in, in the US about um, which productive tree species would do well in different parts of the US and uh, what farmers can sell from those trees. Um, this is partly because post-colonial American agriculture is so new relative to, to the rest of the world. It's only about um, three centuries old. But prior to European settlement and expansion, um, you know, from, from New England down, down the East Coast and across the Midwest, um, silvopasture and forest farming were widely uh, documented practices among Native American groups living, living uh, in New England. Um, but currently, there, there are two federally funded agroforestry centers, uh, one in Nebraska and another in, in Virginia. These were established under the 1990 Farm Bill. And um, these agroforestry, these national agroforestry centers are really critical for the, um, the acquisition of information about agroforestry and the dissemination, the, the dissemination of that information. Um, they, uh, they, they serve as a research hub and as a technical hub to help farmers implement agroforestry practices. And so one thing that we recommend is that Congress funds the additional um, establishment of agroforestry centers that, you know, serve not just um, the, the uh, Nebraska region and Virginia, but also um, in the Intermountain West, in the Northeast, in the Northwest, uh, and Southwest regions. Um, these hubs, when placed sort of around the country, are necessary to kind of conduct research on what agroforestry practices would work well in different parts of the country. Um, as well as provide technical assistance for those first adopters. Um, land access is another big issue that we identified. Um, unlike corn and soy, trees need time to grow, uh, but many kind of younger, more ecologically minded farmers who are interested in adopting these practices are year-to-year -year renters. Um, and when you're renting from year-to-year, -year, that makes investment agroforestry particularly difficult as an economic decision. Um, one farmer who we talked to, um, so next slide, um, who was starting an agroforestry farm, uh, you know, talked about how difficult it was just to establish trees on, you know, 20 acres, or so, sorry, seven acres of land. It cost him, you know, $20,000. 20, um, one solution that we identified is to establish a kind of national um, land bank for agroforestry. And this is possible given that the federal government owns, you know, almost 28% uh, of U.S. land. A lot of this land is concentrated in the West and um, leased out in long-term um, grazing leases. Uh, and a lot of that land can be dedicated to, uh, to agroforestry. Um, we also um, found that, you know, agroforestry could create a, a zero interest uh, farm ownership loan program for agroforestry farmers. Um, you know, a loan program would really help um, would help farmers acquire the capital in the land in the first critical years of um, of adoption. Um, you know, a, a program that would require them to make low payments in the initial years and then ramp up later on um, really fits the economic model of agroforestry. Um, so, so to close, uh, farming trees has really enormous potential to to mitigate climate change. Um, as well as help farmers deal with some of the unavoidable impacts of climate change. Uh, but to get there, substantial changes have to be made, um, starting with research to close the information gap um, and to ensure land access for interested new farmers. Thank you, Lin Chi. And uh, it is exciting to think how trees can make a difference in both climate mitigation and climate resilience. There's these great studies that show that trees intercrop can protect the crops as well as animals from heat stress and other extreme weather. So one of the things Bird mentioned is how uh, many different levers there are, how much is in the farm bill. It's almost it's over 800 pages long. And there's other aspects of U.S. policy that affect agriculture, as Bird mentioned, such as trade and tax policy. And so to look at some of those, and I emphasize only some of those, uh, we turn to my colleague, Nate Rosenberg, who may not be able to use his camera, so you'll see his slides, but not to see him. Yeah, hi, and, and I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm I'm so sorry I can't participate uh, via video today. I had some problems with my computer, um, but thankfully I'm able to. I was able to call in. Um, so looks like I'm not sure. I think I'm going to have to. Yeah, thank you. So. Much of our book is focused on USDA programs and policies, but we also discuss, as uh, Peter mentioned, other critical areas of, of policy that influence agricultural emissions. Peter discussed EPA regulatory tools, uh, or sorry, Peter uh, will discuss EPA regulatory tools, and I'm going to focus here on trade, tax, and federal leasing policy. Uh, next slide, please. The Farm Bill and the Modern Department of Agriculture came out of the New Deal. Uh, the issues that I'm going to discuss also have roots in, or at the very least were debated during the New Deal, but I'm going to skip ahead to the Johnson administration for our first topic, trade policy. So next slide. I'm skipping ahead to Johnson because it was under his leadership uh, that the United States export-oriented agricultural trade policy became dominant. Next slide. Exports uh, had been the focus of agricultural policy since the Eisenhower administration, but there was, for the first time under Johnson, a bar bipartisan consensus to reorient support for the sector away from slide management toward developing export markets. And, and a lot of this had to do with changes in the agricultural industry. The Cotton Belt, for example, in the South um, had been a very supportive of tariffs uh, for, for a long time. But as soy became a much more important crop in the South, uh, they became the, these same farmers uh, and agribusiness interests in the South became much more interested in export policy or focusing on exports. So in 1965, Johnson uh, vowed to double agric agricultural exports within 10 years. And already by 1965, exports uh, of agricultural products made up almost one quarter of total US exports by value. And almost one third of these agricultural exports were moved with federal assistance through aid to other countries, subsidies, and uh, direct sales as well. Next slide. And as you can see uh, with the blue line here, uh, which tracks US agricultural exports over the years, you can see that not only was Johnson's 1965 goal to double agricultural exports within 10 years achieved, but U.S. exports have continued to grow at a very impressive clip. And these figures aren't adjusted for inflation, but even after adjusting for inflation, exports have increased rather dramatically from about 50 billion in 1965 to 133 billion in 2015. Next slide. And as this graph shows, which was produced by the University of Illinois, uh, exports have continued to rise since 2015 and are expected to reach almost 180 billion in 2022. Next slide. Today, agricultural exports make up about 5% of total U.S. exports, and they account for about 20% of U.S. agricultural production by volume. And while the U.S. no longer dominates the global uh, agricultural market, at least to the extent that it used to, demand for U.S. products continues to grow internationally. And uh, critically, climate change often benefits operations with, uh, that, that produce export-oriented crops under current policy, policies. Uh, next slide. So there's a number of things we can do, and, and, and first, stop dumping uh, uh, carbon-intensive agricultural products in other countries uh, would, 
is an important first step. And similarly, stop assistance, such as market development programs um, that in, encourage the, the purchasing and sales of these uh, products in other countries. And then um, at the same time, we can start focusing market development programs, which seek, as the name suggests, to build markets for U.S. agricultural products and technology in other countries on climate-friendly products, like, uh, say, um, agroforestry products uh, or um, more traditional um, crops and, and animals that are produced in a more uh, climate-friendly way. Next slide. And there are a number of different ways in which we can do this. Uh, the, the USDA, uh, through the current farm bill, um, receives about $360 million a year for different market development programs. And then there are also a number of other uh, tools that we can use, such as State Department programs that both formally and informally um, encourage uh, export to other countries international food aid programs, um, uh, either uh, you know, trade negotiations, as uh, one of the earlier graphs showed, have played a major role in increasing exports, and they can be redrafted um, and negotiated uh, so that they encourage more climate-friendly products. And uh, there's been a, a substantial amount of interest in this uh, over the past 10 years, and I think that'll only continue to grow. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, for our next issue, tax policy, I'm going to skip ahead to the Reagan administration. Prior to becoming president, Reagan was one of many wealthy people who used ranching or cattle as a, as a tax shelter. Next slide. This is a 1971 New York Times article about how Reagan, who was then a uh, governor in California, um, was able to pay no California income taxes that year due to his cattle business, and I'm using the word business very loosely here, uh, despite having made um, uh, more than $2 million in, in income that year. And while his federal taxes from that year were not released, it's quite likely that he took advantage of a similar federal tax shelter for farms and ranches. As president, Reagan signed the 1986 Tax Reform Act, which included provisions intended to make the creation of agricultural tax shelters more difficult. It only had limited success. Next slide. As you can see from this headline, Wealthy presidential candidates are still using paper farms to reduce their tax burden. This is a Wall Street Journal article from 2016 explaining how Donald Trump used a small goat herd on his New Jersey golf course to avoid property taxes. Uh, but many real productive farms also benefit from substantial tax benefits. Next slide. In fact, uh, tax expenditures are the single largest so source of subsidies for farms and ranches, and they easily exceed 50% of net farm income. Next slide. And these expenditures take the form of uh, state property tax exemptions, uh, state and federal deductions and credits, and uh, provisions in the Chapter 12 Bankruptcy Code, which allow farms to sell assets with little to no tax liability. And as a result, Chapter 12 is often used by farms strategically solely for tax avoidance. Next slide. Uh, and these, so these tax expenditures drive capital toward agricultural land and production. And they also help drive this investment towards specific modes of production. Among other things, these expenditures increase the value of agricultural land, which in turn makes climate-friendly production riskier and more expensive. But while these tax expenditures currently subsidize 
uh, highly pollute, polluting practices and operations, there's no reason why they can't be retooled to encourage climate friendly practices. We can do this, for example, by taxing highly polluting inputs and operations. And we can also create standards for our current tax expenditures by, for example, excluding highly polluting operations uh, or and requiring basic conservation practices for things like conservation easement deductions. Next slide. So for my final topic, federal grazing fees, I'm gonna to return to the, the Reagan administration. While the federal government had been leasing land to ranchers for decades prior to the Reagan administration. In 1986, he signed an executive order that established in perpetuity, or at least until Congress or a future president act, a, a very low grazing free fee. Next slide. This move was widely criticized at the time since the fees were, even in 1986, quite low. And Reagan's 1986 fee structure also did not account for inflation, ensuring that the fees would continue to fall over time. Next slide. Here you can see how the grazing fees have remained in the same range since the early 1980s, despite changes in the value of the dollar. In 1986, when Reagan signed the executive order, the minimum fee per animal was $1.35. That same minimum fee per animal is still used today, even though $1.35 in 1986 is roughly equivalent to $3.50 today after adjusting for inflation. Next slide. By 2013, federal grazing fees were less than 7% of the rates charged for equivalent grazing lands on private property. Next slide. And this is important because more than 40% of all grazing lands in the United States, approximately 330 million acres, are on federal public lands. Next slide. And this current lease system subsidizes a highly polluting industry. It leads to overgrazing, which increases soil erosion, water pollution, and soil carbon losses. And it ignores environmental considerations despite a clear congressional mandate to the contrary. Next slide. But there are a number of things we can do uh, to address these problems. We can first raise grazing fees to reflect a fair market value or higher. We can update the grazing intensity allot allotments and leases to reflect current levels of forage consumption uh, part of the problem is that the, the assumed levels of forage consumption are often decades old uh, and, and cattle are much larger because of, uh, of breeding um, than they were 10, 20 years ago. Um, yet the, uh, the intensity, the grazing intensity allotments haven't been updated. Uh, we can require basic conservation measures and incentivize more advanced ones. And finally, we can develop special leases to allow uses other than uh, maximizing agricultural production. Okay, so I, uh, that's it, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Great, Nate, thank you very much. Uh, and just in closing, a, a couple points. One, and then this responds a bit to a question. Yeah. That, that I saw. Uh, most of what we've been talking about is federal policy, uh, but of course states have the opportunity to implement their own policies and many states do. Uh, by and large, a lot of the federal farm programs are not really implemented through the states the way, uh, for example, the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act are often delegated to state agencies and implemented at the state level. Uh, but states have parallel opportunities to uh, create incentives for climate friendly practices or to uh, use other authorities they have that can regulate uh, the most polluting industries or, or, uh, or the most polluting actors uh, in the field. So that's an important element and a great opportunity we have here. Uh, there are many, many other aspects uh, of 
opportunities to address agriculture's impact on climate change. Uh, and all I can say is read the book. Um, and as Madison said, uh, while it's out of stock, it'll be back in stock in early March. Uh, and we'll certainly encourage you to take a look. Uh, one issue that is very hot right now is the whole idea of carbon markets. Uh, the Growing Climate Solutions Act has passed the Senate and it's in the House. And a lot of people are very excited about it. And I think it's an area that is going to require, like many of these, because it's new, a lot of very careful thought. Uh, on the one hand, it, it reflects a very uh, obvious and, and powerful idea that we want to create incentives to for farmers to adopt these climate friendly practices. And that is what, for example, the Biden administration has proposed using a billion dollars to uh, create programs to incentivize these changes. But with carbon markets, the idea is using private companies to uh, pay farmers to change their practices. And Marcia mentioned some of the challenges of that from a technical perspective, measuring carbon in the soil, the permanence of carbon in the soil, and others, but there's also some policy issues there. Uh, it's one thing, say, for example, for a food processor to pay the farmers from which they're buying food to change their practices so that they can then advertise a climate-friendly food uh, within their own supply chain. But at least we think it's a very different thing, say, to a, allow a fossil fuel polluter to claim that they are uh, somehow getting closer to net zero target without actually reducing their own emissions by some promise of what some, somebody else is doing. Uh, and so the idea of, of using these agricultural offsets in a compliance market is something that fortunately is not in the Growing Climate Solutions Act and is of great concern. Uh, there are also just a lot of complexities of how this would, would, would work. We'll both discuss in that there are some private companies uh, engaged uh, in some so far relatively small carbon offset markets, uh, but it is certainly going to be a hot topic that we'll see moving forward. So we only have another two minutes, uh, so I we unfortunately can't get many of the uh, audience questions. I will just say quickly, uh, in answer to a couple of questions that I saw, uh, what is the role of corporations, corporate ESG? Uh, the answer is lots of opportunities. I think that's chapter seven of the book. Uh, one, of course, every government as well as corporations can use their procurement power to uh, favor the purchase of climate friendly foods. And there's a big opportunity there uh, that has only barely been touched. And there's also where corporations put their investment dollars. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, as Yen Chi and others mentioned, and as Bird mentioned, uh, into some newer uh, technologies on the farm, some uh, lower climate impact foods, such as alternative meats and proteins. And so there's all sorts of opportunities for the private sector, private sector there. And of course, the great opportunity the private sector has to educate uh, people about the importance of the food system. And food, of course, is so different than many other aspects. We eat food many times a day. We think about it. It's important to us. It's not like you don't really care what goes into your tank as long as your car runs. Uh, and, but food is different, and that creates a great opportunity for, for all of us. Uh, another question was relating to the whole uh, dynamic, say, of biofuels right now. We have about 30 or 40 million acres of cropland being used to grow corn for ethanol, which is really the result not so much of the farm bill, but of the renewable fuel standard, which is in the Clean Air Act. Uh, and you've seen some debates uh, about that, including recent studies showing, and again, we discuss this in the book, that corn-based ethanol is really not a climate solution that it is often uh, claimed to be. And so we are hopeful that that will be very closely looked at. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to use land uh, for renewable energy, and we'll need to do that if we expand solar and wind. Uh, but growing crops and then essentially converting them to fuels or burning them is a very, very efficient way to get energy. And so the biofuel or bioenergy, direct bioenergy markets, are very problematic from a climate perspective. 
Um, there are other questions. I don't know whether Madison will be able to answer those in written form and people will be able to find that or I'll turn it over to you. And I thank you all for joining us. Yeah, sure. Um, we will save the questions and I can send them to you, Peter and Nathan, if you all would like to answer some of them and we can post them on the website. So um, be sure to check back for that. And in that same uh, manner, the slides will also be available on the website, as will a recording of this webinar. So if you'd like to watch it back or send it to someone, um, please check the website where you registered. And thank you so much to our panelists, Peter, Nathan, Marcia, Ferd, and Lingxi. We so appreciate your help with this wonderful webinar. It was so informative. And we want to thank our audience for your engagement. And we do apologize that we couldn't get to more of your questions. But please do be sure to check out Peter and Nathan's book, Farming for Our Future, the Science, Law, and Policy of Climate Neutral Agriculture. I'm sure it will answer some of your questions um, in more detail. So thank you again and have a great day, everyone.